So we're going to talk about Egypt now. And before we get started, here are a couple of pieces of trivia. The Great Pyramid is the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still in existence today. And no nation or culture has survived longer than Egypt's 3,000 years. Here are the terms, so go ahead and write them down and then be listening for them as we move forward. Just to give you a frame of reference, here is the African continent. And if you look up in the northeast, you see the country of Egypt. And that is what we're focusing on here today. I want to put today's material in the context of what we were talking about with Mesopotamia, the formation of a civilization. Egypt is a very different place than the Mesopotamian city-states we talked about before. So I want to talk about how Egypt is different and why it's important. Geography was part of what explained why the cities in Mesopotamia grew. The fact that you had fertile land that could be watered by rivers, although it needed irrigation systems. Land that was open and easy to travel. This led to the formation of small city-states. But it's different in Egypt, although civilization is based around another fertile region. For Egypt, the uniting force was the nation's most important geographic feature, the Nile River. From the highlands of eastern Africa to the Mediterranean Sea, the Nile River flows over 4,100 miles, making it the longest river in the world. And the Nile also has a unique feature. It flows from south to north. And it's key to understanding civilization in this area. On a modern map, Egypt, as you saw, is just a big square country. But most of it is empty desert that has been inhabited throughout history by nomadic people. But when you go into the Nile River Valley, you have extremely rich land, land that is replenished by the flooding of the Nile every year. The Nile River Valley refers to the land on either side of the Nile River. And what happened was that as the snow melted in the north, the Nile flooded, bringing silt and water and, and rich nutrients to the fields on both sides. And it just created this thick strip of intensely rich land. Also, the Nile is calm, smooth flowing for most of its extent. You can go from lower Egypt in the north all the way down to Upper Egypt in the south. The Nile opens up into what's called the Delta, and it's easy to travel from the Delta down to the south. And the reason Lower Egypt is in the north and Upper Egypt is in the south is because of the river flowing from south to north. Now, the Nile also helped with communication because you can send messages from one point to another. Plus, the desert on either side helped isolate the Egyptian people from people to the west and the east. So this is going to be a culture that is self-contained. And that's one of the key differences in how Egypt developed. So, you know, with Mesopotamia, they're living for the most part on a flat plain. They're coming into contact with many people through trade, through travel, through invasion. But with Egypt, as I said, for much of its history, they're going to be isolated from the outside world. So, you know, think about it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It can be a positive thing in that it offers natural protection. They don't have to worry about outside invaders. It allows them to focus on what's going on internally. The flip side of that is that they're isolated. And if they don't have to worry about things like invading armies, well, they're not going to go out of their way to build up their military, to 
to improve upon their weaponry. And so they're going to end up stagnating as a result. The Nile, though, is very important because what we see is that society owed its existence to the Nile, was shaped by the Nile. The Nile had a very regular flooding every year. It was very, very predictable. And because the Egyptians knew exactly when it was going to happen, because it happened at the same time every year, unlike Mesopotamia, um, they could harness that water for agricultural purposes. Ancient Egyptians, because of this, and just because of the regularity in their society, had a more positive outlook on life than did the Mesopotamians. If you recall, I mentioned that the Mesopotamians just kind of had this gloom and doom outlook. And so here's an example to, um, so you can see what I'm talking about. The Egyptians just relished life. They had a happy existence. And so they did not yearn for death and they were very positive and optimistic. So here is a hymn that was inscribed on a pharaoh's tomb. Enjoy yourself while you live. Put on fine linen. Anoint yourself with wonderful ointments. Multiply all your fine possessions on earth. Follow your heart's command on earth. Be joyful and make merry. On the other hand, here is a Sumerian poem. My ill luck has increased, and I do not find the right. I called to my God, but he did not show his face. I prayed to my goddess, but she did not raise her head. And that's the end. So you can see the difference there. The Egyptians, as I said, are very optimistic. And every spring, rain sent water racing down the streams that fed the Nile River. And the ancient Egyptians just eagerly awaited this annual flood. They knew that it was going to soak the land with what they referred to as life-giving water. It deposited a layer of rich soil, and that meant good crops, abundant crops. An Egyptian hymn expressed the happiness of the people during this season. It says, if the Nile smiles, the earth is joyous. Every stomach is full of rejoicing. Every spine is happy. Every jawbone crushes its food. So the Nile provided communication, water, transportation, and so on. It bound the land together. All of Egypt's villages and cities were built along the Nile on a narrow strip of land made fertile by the river. Beyond that, on either side of the river, the land changed suddenly to desert. And the change from fertile land to desert was so abrupt that a person could stand with one foot in each. To the Egyptians, the desert stood for death and the river for life. But as I said earlier, because of the deserts, ancient Egypt had natural defenses against what they referred to as hoofs and horses, and that's invasions. And they experienced relative peace throughout much of their history. For, my, for much of its history, Egypt was spared the constant warfare that plagued the Fertile Crescent. But again, the downside is that society is stagnant because they're not interacting with the larger world. They're not having new ideas enter their country. One of the key forces in Egyptian history, which stretches 3,000 years, is unity, the unity of the land. Egypt represents a territorial state rather than a city-state. A city-state is when your city is your government and your king rules over the city and the lands around it. It would be like living in Jacksonville without being part of the United States. If you go beyond to rule territories a great distance away or other cities, you become a territorial state and that's what Egypt struggled to become. Egyptian history 
can be seen as a series of cycles of unity and periods when the whole thing falls apart, periods of disunity. So how does Egypt come to be? How do the people who inhabit this region come to settle here? It appears to be a mixed population, migrants as well as Africans. There's actually some controversy as to whether there was influence from Mesopotamia or whether Egypt emerged as a second independent civilization. We do know a little about the earlier periods. In the Neolithic period, we see some of the same characteristics that we saw in Mesopotamia, cultivation, settlement, and the domestication of animals at roughly the same time the first cities emerge in Mesopotamia. We know that the Egyptians lived in farming villages early on, and eventually the villages united into agricultural districts called gnomes. Each gnome had its own rituals, gods and chieftain, and often people of rival gnomes attacked one another's territory or, or raided their territory. We know that by 3200 BC, the Egyptians were coming into contact with the people of Mesopotamia. Caravans loaded with goods for trade were traveling between the two regions. Um, that'll change later on and they'll become more of a closed off society. At the same time, we see some important changes taking place in Egypt. The first kings arose and they began unifying the territories of the gnomes. Over time, the gnomes began to merge together, forming larger and larger units, until finally we have two Egypts, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt was in the north, Upper Egypt in the south, again because of the direction that the river flows. We also start to see rulers, kings, and one of the very first to emerge from Egyptian written records was the Scorpion King. Now we're not sure exactly what he looked like, could have looked like this, who knows. We do know that he was a great warrior and we know that he was buried in a very spectacular way. He was buried with pretty much everything he would need in the next life. Um, and that was the point. Everything he brought with him wasn't intended for this life, it was intended for the afterlife. So he had jars of beer, the clothes that he would need in the afterlife, but also wine. And this was interesting because wine was not produced in Egypt because they didn't have the grapevines there. So it's theorized that it would have been imported probably from the Jordan Valley or somewhere around there. He had 700 jars of wine in his tomb, about 4,500 liters. Um, there were um, figs and various types of foods and fruits. And it just really illustrates how the royalty and the upper class were, on the one hand, I guess you could say attracted to special fermented beverages, because I read once that they actually did an analysis of um, the wine that he had in his tomb, and they were able to show that it included lots of um, very special spices, um, like savory thyme and coriander and um, figs were in there as well. And I think I, I think I remember reading that it was the only example that they knew of of fig wine. But, but again, it just kind of shows how the royalty and upper class were attracted to these types of beverages. Um, so you couldn't get it locally, you would have to import it and you would. And it also shows the importance of royal figures like the Scorpion King that he would be buried with that much. Here you see the real Scorpion King engraved on a piece of pottery.
So we know that we end up with Upper and Lower Egypt, and each had its own king, and they could be differentiated by the crowns that they wore. The king of Upper Egypt, as you see in the first figure, wore a crown that looked somewhat like a bowling pin, whereas the king of Lower Egypt wore a crown that looked kind of like a, a chair. But then we start to see a figure wearing a crown that's a combination of the two. And this indicates that Lower, in Egypt, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt have been brought together. They've been unified. So who was the man who unified Upper and Lower Egypt? Well, it was a man named Narmer. And he is considered to be the unifier of Egypt around 3150 BC and Egypt's first pharaoh or king. He's sometimes known as Menesh, although more recently scholars believe that was more of an honorific title than a name. So what do we know about him? Well, we know that before he came along, there was conflict between the cities of Upper and Lower Egypt, resulting in chaos. Then he comes along, he brings order, and from that order, prosperity. And it was believed that chaos would come again. So the king, the idea was that the king needed to be vigilant. And he had to be a mighty warrior who could subdue the forces of chaos whenever necessary, whenever that need arose. So he unifies the two lands through conquest. And then he instituted policies that brought peace and order. Um, it's thought that he was responsible for some advances in society, and he also was responsible for instituting religious practices and formalized beliefs in Egypt. His reign was so prosperous that the Egyptians didn't have to work as hard as they used to, and they were able to develop hobbies like carving and sculpting, sports, brewing beer, um, things like that, and just generally living in luxury. In fact, a later writer claimed that Menesh invented the concept of luxury. Now here's part of the myth about him. According to this story, he rode on the back of a crocodile to escape rabid hunting dogs, founding a city called Crocodilopolis along the way. He founded the great city of Memphis, that's true actually, and that becomes his capital. And according to a Greek historian, he actually built Memphis after constructing a dam on the Nile to divert water away from the chosen site of his city. And he created a great palace there along with administrative buildings on land that had previously been underwater, which accounted for the fertility of all the surrounding land. He introduced the practice of sacrificing to the gods and ensured that harmony was observed throughout the land. So that part is true. This next part, not quite so sure. After a long and prosperous reign, he was carried off or maybe killed by a hippopotamus. So we don't know if that happened. We do know that he ruled for 62 years and the other things I mentioned for the most part are true. He set Egypt on the path to peace and prosperity. And here you see a map showing the city of Memphis, which he founded as his capital. And this will become a magnificent city. So who was the Pharaoh? Egyptians generally believed in the Pharaoh, not just as an absolute ruler, but as an embodiment of a god. They believed in many gods. This was a polytheistic society. And one of the chief early gods was Ra, who was associated with the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was thought to be the embodiment of Ra on earth. So the Pharaoh was considered to be a god king. Not that authority came from the gods, but that 
Pharaoh is the god. So this is unlike Mesopotamia, where the kings are the link between man and the gods. Here, the Pharaoh is the god. And this belief led to stable government for many, many centuries. And so you have this government where the leader claims to rule by the will of the god, which he is. So the kingdom created by Menish held together long after he died. Members of his family passed the crown from father to son to grandson. When one ruling family or dynasty died out or lost control, another took its place. And eventually, the history of ancient Egypt will consist of an amazing 31 dynasties at least. And again, it's a government ruled by a god. And not just any god, Pharaoh was viewed as a benevolent protector. And this is one of the, the functions of the Pharaoh. Um, and people believed this for centuries. So it's the idea that this God is there to protect the people, to watch over them, to uphold order, not just in Egypt, but in the universe. The Pharaoh was supposed to preserve the cosmic order in the universe, in earthly affairs, and he provided a link between this world and the other world. This idea of order is embodied in the concept of ma'at, cosmic order and justice. Ma'at was the idea of justice, right, truth, and order. To live according to ma'at meant always trying to act correctly and justly, and everyone, including the pharaoh, was supposed to uphold this ideal. So this is what a scholar wrote about this idea. He wrote that, quote, the crux of the ancient Egyptian system of beliefs was the relationship between order, ma'at, and chaos. Although a state of order was considered to be the ideal, it was acknowledged that an opposing yet interdependent state of chaos must exist in order for equilibrium to be achieved. So ma'at is this idea that you have harmony in society and the pharaohs there to preserve that harmony this belief permeated every aspect of Egyptian culture including the office of the pharaoh so the pharaoh was charged with keeping the peace and upholding the law making sure the weak were not harmed by the strong and there's evidence that this seemed to work even at the level of the ordinary man. But can the Pharaoh do it all himself? Well, the Pharaoh depended on a vizier or a chief minister to supervise the business of government. Under the vizier, various bureaus looked after matters like tax collection, farming, and the irrigation system. Thousands of scribes carried out the vizier's instructions. One vizier, maybe the most famous, was Tahotep, and he actually wrote a book called Instructions of the Vizier Tahotep. In it, he advised ambitious young people to avoid the errors that he had seen all too often among officials. He wrote, let not your heart be puffed up because of your knowledge. Be not confident because you are wise. Take counsel with the ignorant as well as the wise. So, you know, he's saying, don't think just because you have this high important position that you're above everybody. Be open to suggestion from everybody, not just those powerful people at the top. Just as Mesopotamia developed cuneiform, Egyptians used hieroglyphics. And these were a combination of alphabetic symbols, um, symbols for syllables, and words um, or pictures that stood for words or ideas. And there were about a thousand symbols altogether.
hieroglyphics was really beautiful to look at, but very time consuming to create. And so it was reserved for the most important texts, the writings decorating tomb and temple walls and texts recording royal achievements. As they went about their daily business, Egypt's scribes routinely used something called hieratic, that's H-I-E-R-A-T-I-C. This was a simplified or shorthand form of hieroglyphic writing. Towards the end of the dynastic period, they used demotic, an even more simplified version of hieratic. And all three scripts were used to write the same um, ancient Egyptian language. Very few of the people living back then would have been able to read, as I said earlier, and so it's estimated that no more than 10% and maybe even less of the population was literate. They also used their geography. Um, the paper they wrote on was papyrus, which was made from river reeds found down by the Nile River. And I will say that this is a system, hieroglyphics, that's going to evolve over time. Very similar to, to um, cuneiform in Mesopotamia, because there were so many symbols, it's not going to generally be available to everyone, but instead you'll see people at the top of society, scribes being trained to um, become literate, to learn this, and then they will usually work for the, the pharaoh or nobles or people at the top of society. There were also different types of hieroglyphics. Um, for example, there was a type that was used for religious literature, um, and then others will be used for business purposes and so forth. So how are we able to translate hieroglyphics? How do we know what they say? Well, for centuries, we had no idea. But then that's going to change. And it's thanks to the Rosetta Stone that we're able to decipher them. And here you see the Rosetta Stone on the left. This is a document, really, an official government document written in three languages. It's the same message written in three languages. At the top, you have Ancient Egyptian. At the bottom, you have Greek. And then in the middle, you have something called Demotic. Um, we will be talking about Alexander the Great in a few weeks and how he spread Greek culture everywhere. And he ushered in a new era, the Hellenistic era, which sees a blending of different cultures. And Demotic was the language that was used for government purposes in Egypt during that time. Egypt becomes a kingdom ruled by Greeks. And so Demotic was a mixture of Egyptian and Greek. And so what happens is that Napoleon Bonaparte, the great French conqueror, leader, he was an avid Egyptologist. And he actually led an expedition to Egypt at one point. And during that time, the stone, the Rosetta Stone is found along with many other artifacts. And then in the years that followed, scholars just worked very hard to try to decipher it. And what they ended up doing was first deciphering the Greek on the bottom. Then using that, they worked backwards went to the Demotic next, plugged in all the Greek words that they had translated. Because they knew what the message said in Greek, they were able to then fill in the blanks with the other words in um, the Demotic, and then worked backwards again to the hieroglyphs until finally they could translate the message. But at the same time, it showed them what each of those hieroglyphs stood for. And that, in turn, unlocked ancient Egyptian society for us. Um, the Rosetta Stone is key to understanding the ancient Egyptian world. And it's actually very important because the spoken language of ancient Egypt died out about a thousand years ago.
The Old Kingdom dates to the third millennium BC and it set the pattern for Egypt's culture for nearly 3,000 years. The capital was in Memphis and the highest artistic achievement of culture was reached during the Old Kingdom. We know that many pyramids were constructed, the Sphinx was built, and this is the period we tend to think of when we think of Egypt. It's the age of the pyramids. The pyramids were the tombs of the pharaohs, and they were meant to be a way to allow their souls to be transported to heaven. They reflect the yearning for eternity and the desire to overcome death. In contrast to the gloom and doom of the Mesopotamians, Egyptians believed that the afterlife was actually a happy continuation of earthly life, at least for the pharaohs and aristocrats, but they believed that there they would be reunited with friends and families and even pets. And because of that, the tombs were outfitted for that belief so that their trip to the hereafter would be as comfortable as possible. And so they would take goods with them. They would take food and drink. They would take clothing. They would take their wealth. They would take dishes and luxury items. They would take their boats and chariots and thrones and all sorts of things. They often literally also took friends and family with them. In fact, documentation shows that some of the tomb, in some of the tombs, the interior doors show scratch marks from inside because quite often, like servants, for example, would be locked inside while still alive with the pharaoh because, well, if you're the pharaoh, you're going to need servants, right? But it's just an example of the power of the pharaoh and the idea that they believed that once he gets to the afterlife, his life is just going to continue as it had been. The most famous pyramids are those at Giza, and this is a plateau outside the city of Cairo. When they were initially built, they were really isolated out in the desert. But in more recent years, they've been threatened by urban sprawl as the city has inched its way out into the desert. But this is a series of pyramids associated with the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. And these were men who attempted immortality by building these enormous monuments. And what strikes everyone is their huge size and the enormous effort that went into creating them. There are three major pyramids um, devoted to the pharaohs, three pharaohs, and then a series of smaller pyramids devoted to their wives. They're expressions of this unifying ideal, but also part of the myth that Egyptian rulers were exploitive, exploitative and used slave labor. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Here you see the largest of the pyramids, called the Great Pyramid. Um, this was devoted to a pharaoh named Khufu, sometimes called Chops. It is 481 feet tall, and you can compare that to the tallest ziggurat in Mesopotamia, which was only about 60 feet tall. Big difference. The Great Pyramid contains more than 2 million perfectly chiseled stones. And when I say perfectly chiseled, I mean the sides are just so perfect that they fit together and there's absolutely no space between, meaning no mortar or any filling is needed. Each perfectly cut stone block weighs at least two and a half tons. And what's really amazing is that, first of all, the stones did not come from this region. They're out in the desert. So these stones had to be hauled miles and miles from the quarries where they were, um, where they came from, where they originated. And it's also amazing because ancient Egyptians 
really only had rudimentary mathematical skills. So the Great Pyramid is considered to be a great engineering and architectural accomplishment. Now, the classical historian Herodotus believed that the Great Pyramid had been built by 100,000 slaves. And his image of men, women, and children just desperately toiling in the harshest of conditions has proved remarkably popular with modern film producers. Because if you ever watch movies, at least those made in past decades, if you watch movies about Egypt, like the Ten Commandments, it shows all the slaves working on the, the um, government projects. This would have been one of those. This vision of Herodotus, though, is wrong. Archaeological evidence indicates that the Great Pyramid was, in fact, built by a workforce of 5,000 permanent salaried employees and up to 20,000 temporary workers. And these workers were free men. They were summoned under a system called the corvée system. And it was basically a system of national service where you would come, you'd put in a three or four month shift on the building site before returning home. And quite often it would be farmers in the off season, they would come and work on this project. And they would be housed in a temporary camp near the pyramid where they received payment in the form of food, drink, medical attention, um, if they died on duty, burial was in the nearby cemetery. So this idea that Egypt was a slave state, I mean, it's not totally false cause, because, yes, there were slaves in Egypt, but much of the work in Egyptian society was actually done by citizens. And one reason for that was that this is a a society and a or this is an economy without money and so the labor of these citizens is essentially the taxes that they're paying to the government and construction of the pyramids was an enormous expenditure of wealth but it didn't really represent tyranny as much as the ideal of the pharaoh as a divine being being buried in the center of these monuments. And here you see a drawing showing the interior of the Great Pyramid. And as you can see, there um, were various chambers within the structure. And this is where like the pharaoh's tomb would be and then the grave goods. And they also quite often would have what we refer to as booby traps designed to keep outsiders out. I want to look just for a moment at the process of mummification. The mummy, which was an eviscerated, dried, and bandaged corpse, has become a defining Egyptian artifact. But mummification was an expensive and time-consuming process. It was reserved for the more wealthy members of society. The vast majority of Egypt's dead were buried in simple pits in the desert. So why did the pharaohs and later the elite feel the need to mummify their dead? Well, they believed that it was possible to live again after death, but only if the body retained a recognizable human form. Ironically, this could have been achieved quite easily by burying the dead in direct contact with the hot and sterile desert sand. Um, just an, a natural um, desiccation would have occurred but the elite wanted to be buried in coffins within tombs. And this meant that their corpses, no longer in direct contact with the sun, started to rot. So they came up with this elaborate procedure with elaborate burial equipment that would allow them to preserve the body. And the process took more than two months. They then wrapped the body in bandages. And the bandages of an ancient Egyptian mummy could stretch for nearly a mile if unwrapped. 
but this is what most people think of when they think of Egypt, the pyramids and the mummies. Initially, it's just the pharaohs and their families who are um, going through this process, and that's in the Old Kingdom. Later on in Egypt's history and the Middle and New Kingdoms, we'll also see this process applying to the nobility, the people at the top of society, the wealthy. So here you see another map showing the capital of Memphis up in the north, and then down to the south a bit, another city that begins to rise to prominence, and this is the city of Thebes. And what we see is that Egypt has become a very wealthy state, and the construction of the pyramids was a huge expenditure, as I said a few moments ago, but it didn't really bankrupt them. People suppose, have over the years supposed that the country just exhausted itself building these monuments for the pharaoh, but Egypt was a wealthy land and could well afford these building projects. And what we also see is this idea of unity that I mentioned before. Unity held Egypt together. But then what we're going to see are intermediate periods when that unity breaks apart. What happens is that Egypt is invaded. For much of the Old Kingdom, Egypt was fairly isolated, not really coming into contact very much with the outside world. But now invaders come across the desert and they come in such large numbers that the Egyptians can't stop them. Most of the invaders were Bedouins or Asiatic. Asiatic peoples and it's thought that there may have been some climate um, problems or just disruptions in the areas in which they were living which forced them to pick up and begin migrating. So what ends up happening is they come in in such large numbers that they end up just taking over parts of Egypt for a time and the Egyptians are going to have to, to rise up and try to force them out. And this is what's known as the first intermediate period. Finally, the city of Thebes rises up and does become powerful enough to force the invaders out. And that is when we enter the Middle Kingdom. So the first intermediate period ends and we enter the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom is a period where we're gonna have a new dynasty emerge. A new dynasty is founded and the kings are from Thebes and they're going to begin to assert control over the entire country. The Middle Kingdom is different from the Old Kingdom for several reasons. During the Middle Kingdom, we see a moving away from the really ostentatious period of pyramid building of the Old Kingdom. And this was for a pretty simple reason. It was pretty well known that the pyramids housed the body of the Pharaoh and had great wealth inside of them. So if you think about it, it's kind of like posting a rob me sign on the door. And over the years, grave robbers had been breaking into them and, and just stripping them of their wealth. So later kings learned this lesson. And we're going to see a change in the way the pharaohs and the aristocrats are buried during the Middle Kingdom. During the Middle Kingdom, we do still see some pharaohs building pyramids. In fact, to date, more than 130 pyramids have been found, some built in the Old Kingdom, some in the New Kingdom. A great many of the pharaohs, though, decided to do something else. Rather than building pyramids, they opted to have more isolated tombs that were less ostentatious, smaller monuments in remote regions. And some of them even began to hide their tombs in places like the Valley of the Kings. And here you see a picture of a portion of the Valley of the Kings. And this, re this refers to um, this place out in the desert where there are numerous tombs of pharaohs.
here you see a map detailing the various tombs of pharaohs that have been found in the Valley of the Kings. And as you can see by the list of names on the left and the numbers on the map, there's been quite a few of them. And just the fact that we still are seeing these tombs devoted to these pharaohs is an example of the, the fact or the idea that the people aren't giving up on the pharaoh or the idea of the pharaoh. They're still devoting an enormous amount of resources to the veneration of the pharaoh. It's just that that veneration is happening in a slightly different way. Another thing we see during the Middle Kingdom is a new way of crowning your successor. And this is something called co-optation. Now, there was a major problem during the Old Kingdom in that you have these pharaohs who have many, many children by many, many wives and concubines. And the heir to the throne would be the oldest, but there would be other brothers or half-brothers who would want that crown. And so intrigue and murder was quite common. So co-optation was a method of trying to avoid that. It's the idea that the pharaoh crowned his successor while he was still alive. And that way, when he died, the pharaoh's already crowned. The point was to ensure a smooth succession, to draw, try to do away with the, the violence that had become associated with the um, choosing and crowning of the next pharaoh. The pharaohs of the Middle Kingdom become known especially for their warlike abilities. And there are actually a series of pharaohs who become famous for leading expeditions outside of Egypt. In the Middle Kingdom, Egypt, they begin to assert their power over areas to the south, places like Nubia and in the north and east into Syria and Palestine. It's during this time that Egypt starts to become a conquering state. Now, again, during the Old Kingdom, Egypt is isolated from the outside world, but that hurt them when the first intermediate period occurred. Now, they decide to start opening themselves up, and this is the phase in Egyptian history when it becomes imperial, controlling other cultures and lands, and they start to project their power. This brings in enormous wealth and a lot of wealthy goods, and it also starts to open Egypt up to other cultural influences. And more and more, we see imported goods on display in tombs and a greater interest in the outside world. Another thing we see in the Middle Kingdom is that where previously there had been a total focus on the Pharaoh, now a lot of these ideas seem to have trickled down so that the middle classes and the moderately wealthy have elaborate tombs of their own to ensure their happiness in the afterlife. They're connecting to the other world by being pious and having lots of grave goods becomes more widespread during this period. So we learn more about the lives and beliefs in the middle class during this period and also about the poor as well. We see offerings showing farmers and peasants and bakers and craftspeople at work. These are not produced by the people themselves, but by their betters, the middle class, kind of like bragging, this is who I control, how big my bakery is and so forth. It's a period of social reform as well, as we see people trying to improve society. Now, another thing we see is a focus on all aspects of society. And we see that in the art, whereas during the old kingdom, the focus of the art would have been the Pharaoh. Now, we still see that, but we're also seeing other segments of society being portrayed. And in this picture, you see a boy driving his donkeys, and then down at the bottom, men threshing grain. These are just ordinary people.
After the Middle Kingdom comes the Second Intermediate Period, a time when Egypt was invaded and then divided. The invasions came from the deserts as um, Lower Egypt was invaded by people known as the Hyksos. They were military nomads and barbarians who came from the north and who grew into such large numbers that they eventually took over Lower Egypt and established their own state with rulers that they called pharaohs. The Hyksos had some advantages. Egypt had begun to open up during the Middle Kingdom, but they still had a long way to go if they wanted to catch up. And yet here come the Hyksos, whereas Egypt had always relied on physical location as its defense. These nomads had war chariots, armor, and horses, things the Egyptians didn't necessarily have. The Hyksos brought with them a new reign. And this was really, really traumatic for the Egyptians because they always believed that they were the superior people. And yet here they have been conquered and are being ruled. And this is something that the Egyptians are going to remember for centuries. And again, just very, very traumatic for the Egyptian people and something they're never going to forget. And so what happens is that the Egyptians are ruled by the Hyksos for a long time. Ultimately, the city of Thebes becomes powerful enough again to drive out the Hyksos and we enter the new kingdom. Here you just see a map showing the two kingdoms. You see the kingdom ruled by the Hyksos up in the north, and then down in the south, you see what's left of Egypt. The unity is gone. New Kingdom Egypt is a period of maximum expansion. After freeing the land from foreign control, the Egyptian pharaohs became very concerned that it never happened again. So how do you prevent that from happening? Well, you go out and you do the conquering. And that's what ends up happening. During this period, Egypt takes control of parts of Syria and Palestine. And it's later in this period that the Bible puts the journey of the Israelis in Egypt. This is the period of Egypt's maximum expansion, and we see it reflected in the art and monuments of the kingdom. One of the most common images was of the pharaoh conquering foreigners who were always shown as captives or slaves, and usually with beards, so clearly they're not Egyptian. So for the New Kingdom, I want to just look at a few of the famous and influential rulers, starting with Hatshepsut. Now, Hatshepsut's father was the pharaoh. She was raised to be a ruler, but not alone. When her father died, she married her half-brother, and that was very common, and the point was to keep the bloodline pure of the royal family but she marries her half-brother and he grows up and then ends up dying and and he rules but then he ends up dying and that leaves her now the heir was her husband's infant son by another woman however he's a baby he obviously can't rule and so she steps in to rule just until he's old enough to take over. She steps in as regent. And records seem to indicate that in the beginning she actually was ruling as regent. But then somewhere along the line, she decides to just outright declare herself pharaoh. And so she ends up ruling as pharaoh. Now, when you're ruling as regent, that means that you're ruling just until that person is old enough to come in and take over. And initially, that's what she intended. However, again, along the way, that changes. She decides that she actually likes this power. And she decides that she really doesn't want to let it go. 
And so she's going to end up ruling for several decades. And um, her stepson isn't going to be happy about this at all. In fact, he's, he grows up and he's just chomping at the bit to get rid of her so he can proclaim himself Pharaoh. And I'm sure it's a huge coincidence, but she died a mysterious death, very mysterious. Nobody was quite sure what happened to her. Most likely, her stepson wanted to hurry his own path to the throne. So here you see some images of her, and the picture in the, on the top middle is actually of her mummy. It's a really interesting story. Howard Carter, the Englishman who found King Tut's tomb, actually found her tomb a decade and a half beforehand. Unfortunately, her sarcophagus was empty. However, he also discovered a neighboring tomb with two, two um, caskets, sarcophagus, and one of them contained the body of her wet nurse. The other contained an unidentified body, and he believed that this might be hot chepset. So they've done testing and determined that this very well might have been her. What really sealed it, though, was back in, I believe, 2006, a small box had been found with her name on it, and inside was a, a tooth, a molar. Well, it was discovered that this molar was a perfect fit for a missing tooth in this other body's, um, or the, this body, the unidentified body. So they confirmed that this was indeed Hatshepsut. She was actually a very good ruler while she was on the throne. Unlike other Middle Kingdom pharaohs, she focused on building up trade, on building up the economy. And so Egypt becomes very, even more wealthy and even more prosperous during her reign until she dies. Once she was dead, her stepson, who evidently was glad to get her out of the way, ordered that her monuments and statues be defaced. And so she was literally almost chiseled out of history. Hatshepsut's stepson was Tutmos III. And once she died, he stepped up and took the throne. And one other thing I actually wanted to mention about Hatshepsut she was a woman ruling in a man's world and quite often she would appear in public or images of her would appear showing her wearing men's clothes and a false beard and it wasn't necessarily that she was trying to pose as a man it's just there were no precedents for a woman ruling and so she was just showing the masculine form of the position of Pharaoh. Well, now we have Tutmos. And Tutmos III proved to be a much more warlike ruler than his stepmother. And between the time he took power and his death, he conducted at least 15 victorious invasions into Palestine and Syria. And also, his armies pushed far south and returned with thousands of Nubian slaves. Under Tutmos, Egypt reached its largest geographic extent. In fact, modern historians think of him as the Napoleon of Egypt, Napoleon being the great French conqueror. Tutmos believed that the lack of empire made Egypt vulnerable, and so he wanted to remedy that. He also recognized the commercial value of empire, and he revived and expanded trade. So under Tutmos, Egypt becomes a mighty, powerful empire, controlling lands around the Nile and far beyond, and drawing enormous wealth from them. From Lebanon came timber, iron, and silver. From Nubia came gold, cattle, and ivory.
we also see something called cultural diffusion as Egypt under Tutmos is coming into contact with many different countries and people. And this brings new ideas and new material goods into Egypt. Egypt had never before, nor has it since, commanded such power and wealth as it did during the reign of Tutmos III. And here on this map, you can see Tutmos's conquests, and you can see how Egypt is expanding far beyond its borders. A later pharaoh is going to be Akhenaten, known as the heretic king. So why? Well, he began his life as a Menetep, but along the way, he ends up changing the religion of Egypt. He becomes one of the first monotheists, worshiping one god. When the sun rose every morning, Amenhotep worshiped it as a god. And this wasn't anything new, as the sun had always been worshiped by Egyptians as one of their many gods. But Amenhotep made a new and shocking claim. He claimed that this sun god, Aten, um, sometimes known as the sun disk, was the only true god in the universe. And so what he does is he decrees that everybody worship only Aten. And he changes his name to Akhenaten to incorporate the name of the god in his name. And he makes Egypt a monotheistic nation. So what happens is that the pharaoh tries to divorce power from Egypt's traditional religious system that had a priesthood that supported the king, but that also tried to control him. He substituted the worship of Aten, the sun disk, for worship of the traditional Egyptian gods. So, you know, think about the chaos that this would cause if all of a sudden you're told, okay, you can't practice your religion. This is your new religion. And true, all of those priests who were devoted to worshiping the various gods and goddesses, they're out of a job now and they're not happy at all. Akhenaten's wife was Nefertiti, considered to be one of the most beautiful women of the ancient world. And she is said to have been in on many of the policy decisions he made. Um, maybe not necessarily the decision regarding the religion, but others. And I do want to add that scholars have long debated whether Akhenaten was really a religious idealist and monotheist, or instead just a shrewd politician whose move was designed to break the power of the priests. Whatever his motives, his attempts to impose mono, monotheism do end up dying with him. But while he's alive, Egypt is a monotheistic country. Also, he and Nefertiti create a revolution of sorts, another revolution. In addition to the religious revolution he's created, they create an artistic revolution. The two of them begin this artistic revolution known as the Amarna Revolution. And it's called that because the city of Amarna became the focal point. So if you look on this map, Amarna lies on the Nile in between Memphis and Thebes. And this revolution consisted of the idea that artists should depict life as it really is naturalism or realism in art. Akhenaten decreed that Amarna would not only be the focal point of this new artistic revolution, but also would become the center of his government. And so he decreed that all government officials move there. So can you imagine what that would entail? You know, think of the United States. What would happen if it was decreed that our, our capital was moving from Washington, D.C. to, you know, say, Omaha, Nebraska? Think of 
how many people would be impacted by this you know it's not just the government officials it's their families it's the secretaries it's everybody who's involved in any way with the running of the government it would be a nightmare but that is what ends up happening here you see an example of a piece of art from the Amarna Revolution this is a family portrait of sorts we see Akhenaten and Nefertiti with several of their children. And primary in the picture, top center, is the sun disk, Aten, shining down on them. And it's interesting to note that now for us today, this probably doesn't look very realistic. But for the people of ancient Egypt, it really was because it's not like the stiff stylized art of before. And what we're really seeing is the royal family just sitting here kind of relaxed with their children, um, even though their children kind of look like alien babies. It's interesting to note too, that it's believed the heir to the throne, um, Akhenaten's eldest son, is in this picture as well. And that is Tutankhamun or King Tut. So what ends up happening? Well, Akhenaten, like Hatshepsut, also suffers a very mysterious death. It's believed that he might have succumbed to a conspiracy. Um, it's possible that the priests were behind his death wanting to regain power whatever the case may be, he dies mysteriously. Everything is reversed and goes back to the way it had been before. And he also is almost chiseled out of history as people who come after him want to, it's like they want to just forget the chaos of his reign. Akhenaten's successor was his son Tutankhamun sometimes known as the boy king. He did not rule very long, just a few years, and he was very young when he died, only about 19. And in fact, he's not really known for anything he did while he ruled. Rather, he's known for his death and his glorious tomb. What happened, it's believed, is that when Akhenaten died, Tutankhamun comes to the throne and he's still a boy. Well, he reverses the reforms that his father had made. So everything goes back to the way it had been. And that means those priests, as I said, are back in business. It's believed by many scholars that they wanted to reward Tutankhamun for putting them back in power, basically. And so when he did die, um, under somewhat mysterious circumstances, they filled his tomb to the brim with grave goods, even more than, than usual were put in there as a way of thanking him. Tutankhamun, or King Tut's tomb, was not found along with other tombs that had been found. And an Englishman named Howard Carter for years was determined to find it. He was convinced that it was out there. Um, now this is the same man who discovered Hatshepsut's tomb earlier. He spent years studying and investigating, trying to figure out the exact location of where he thought this tomb was. Then he was able to raise funding for an expedition, headed down to Egypt, and lo and behold, he ends up finding the tomb in 1922. Here you see the entrance to the tomb. Now, obviously, this is a more modern entrance that has been built to the existing tomb. Here you see a blueprint of the interior of King Tut's tomb. As you can see, it consisted of uh, numerous corridors and chambers each of which was just filled to the top with grave goods, very expensive grave goods. Here we see Howard Carter with the mummy 
of King Tut. And here are just a few of the items found in King Tut's tomb. We see several gold thrones. We see a chariot. Um, one room co consisted of gold, just gold items. Another had an actual boat that had sailed down the Nile. It just amazed people when this became public. It also, well, it made worldwide news, but it also brought with it a story of sorts, um, a mystery. For years, people talked about the curse of King Tut's tomb. And they said this because there were a number of people associated with the expedition who died under mysterious circumstances. In fact, Howard, Carter, Howard Carter's canary, which evidently had been along with him, also ended up dying. Now, they have discovered that most likely what happened is that, you know, they opened this tomb, which hadn't been opened in more than 3,000 years, and there would have been gases inside that for the first time are being exposed to, to fresh air, and they most likely inhaled that without knowing. And so that probably caused some damage to their lungs. Finally, we come to Ramses II. Ramses II is considered to be the last of the great pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And in fact, he is considered to be the greatest pharaoh of all of Egyptian history. So what did he do? Well, he was one of the greatest builders of the New Kingdom, building large structures throughout Egypt. He expanded the borders of Egypt greatly through a number of conquests. He reigned for many years, lived to a ripe old age, and was the father of 150 children. Um, obviously, he had more than one wife. After Ramses, we see the decline of ancient Egypt as it's gradually broken up into small city-states. Other strong civilizations were now rising to challenge Egypt's power. At the end of this period, Egypt began to collapse again because of outside invasion, and the collapse seems to be more or less permanent at that point. Egypt would be an independent power through the first millennium, but after the collapse of the New Kingdom, Egypt was not able to successfully regain the unity that it had before. And as we move forward, we'll see that it will never again rise to be the great power that it once was. And it's also going to have long periods in its history when it's under foreign domination. So the unity that Egypt worked so hard to attain is going to be broken.